Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we have Nepal Shadar joining us, and Nepal is going to be talking about blood sacrifice and cannibalism in the Bible. Right. Thank you so much for having me, Esoteric. This has been a long time coming, and I'm very excited to talk about this topic. I've almost, I've, I've become very intrigued with the, um, the concept uh, and the origin of blood sacrifice as far as worship. Um, now, I want to start with some science and go back to early human beings. Now, I was saying Australopithecus before, but we can even go even further back to um, a millennium man, which was a being, uh, uh, an animal, a species um, that uh, precedes us as human, as homo sapiens, a, a prototype, uh, have you, a different species of um, hominids that um, basically are the earliest hominid that we know of, okay? Why am I talking about science? Because we're going to bridge the gaps between believers and non-believers. We're going to go step by step and look at humans and how we started to do what we do in worship. Okay. So with that said, going back to that particular species that, that of, of hominid discovered, that animal um, was bipedal. So we know that it is, um, you know, one of our uh, fellow hominids. We, it's sure that these Australopithecus, uh, Millennium Man, before Homo erectus, we know they weren't eating meat. Oh, I got that out. I know I, it was a lot, but I want to make, I just want to let people know they weren't eating meat in the sense of slaughtering animals and eating the flesh of animals, hunting and slaughtering, trapping and slaughtering. Now, it will be argued that um, Millennium Man that was discovered in Africa about, you know, and, and the bones dated, the fossils dated about six million years ago, five to six million years ago. There's an argument that, oh, well, they ate insects. So that's not what I'm talking about when I say meat. I'm not talking about foraging in trees. We're talking about blood and hunting and eating flesh of animals, large animals, okay? So those, those early hominids did not eat meat. And knowing this, we also have information that their brains were very small. Now, having small brains, they, they use most of their energy to digest the food they ate. They ate a lot of vegetation, um, a lot of grinding of, of, of nuts and bark and grass, all the, all the things that you would imagine um, a creature that lives in the trees and on the ground would eat, okay? Very similar to grazing animals today and similar to uh, chimpanzees or, or even um, apes like orangutans that live in the trees, okay? I know this seems like, what is she giving us? This history lesson, but it's important because it's exciting when you do, when you connect the dots, it's exciting to say, wow, that makes sense where blood sacrifice came from. That makes sense why we worship God this way. So I digress. So we have millennium man, six, five to six million years ago. Then we get a little bit younger, Australopithecus, um, you know, uh, three million years ago, 3.6 million years ago, uh, these creatures, these animals, these hominids were eating basically vegetation. They were not eating blood meat. They weren't eating meat with blood, okay? Well, they had a longer intestinal tract, smaller brains, larger jaws, because all the energy about six hours a day where all that energy was going to digestion. None, uh, very little energy was going to the development of the brain, brain building. However, 
when we when we get to the species of Homo erectus, which is a younger species, I know the species overlapped, but stay with me. Homo erectus, a younger species, then you see some real meat eating. You see um, the uh, eating of flesh. You know, there's evidence that the Homo erectus, that hominid, ate larger animals and there was blood and flesh being eaten. So then what happened, what happened was that hominid, the brain started to uh, eating the meat and more energy went toward brain development. So exponentially the brain, the neurological system of um, the hominids started to develop. And that's when we can see the connection between consciousness um, being able to uh, philosophize or philosoph philosophize, um, being able to uh, create thought, reason, understanding your surroundings, uh, looking up at the cosmos, making sense of your surroundings, of your environment. And all of that came from blood, from eating meat, all of that. All of that brain development, brains were uh, became, you know, 60% uh, larger than, than the other hominids that, that uh, predate the Homo erectus. And then we go further and we, so we, there's evidence of meat eating. And in that we see evidence of um, uh, people starting to have organ, organization, uh, how do you say culture, organization, um, you can see, now I'm jumping all over the place, but stay with me. You can see in um, uh, Homo sapiens, we're coming a little little closer. We, that's what we are. After Homo erectus, we see the Homo sapiens. We had order, we had structure. We had different social groups. We had different social meetings. In fact, in Neanderthals, there were there's evidence of Neanderthals meeting um, in a particular spot annually to trade um, women, okay? So for, amongst different Neanderthal groups. What am I saying? We began to think, we began to um, use critical thought. We began to, we became intelligent beings with philosophies and with, uh, we, we created, or for some, if you're an atheist, we'll say we created, but for others who are not atheists, we wrapped our minds about around the concept of God, right? Now, it, as we ate the meat and we saw the meat made us intelligent, we saw eating the blood made us intelligent. Because by the way, when we first started eating meat, we there wasn't fire. Fire um, wasn't discovered until about, now I'm talking about Homo erectus, until about 200,000 years. Don't quote me on that. Okay, shout out to, to um, can I shout anybody out? No, I don't know. Shout out to Gutsig Given, because she's on point with that, with, with that archaeology. But um, just for the most part, with my very, very primitive, simple, uh, general information, it's, which is still factual, that very generally, um, hundreds of thousands of years after we started eating meat, did we find fire. And there's evidence of us using fire in caves of South Africa. So we weren't eating meat. We were eating, um, we were homophages, you know, um, uh, amophagy. We were eating raw meat. We were eating our meat raw. That's very important because the taste of the blood, the, the, the way the blood, the chemical makeup of the blood, how it affected us, really um, went toward a lot of our worship. But then when we found fire, we started to cook the meat and the smell, uh, you know, just the scent of the, of the, of the burning meat really, um, I don't know if it's something that we always had innately or, but, but I do know that even now when you, a lot of people, I'm sorry to the vegetarians and the vegans, but when you smell meat, it triggers even a physiological response. Your mouth starts to water when you smell it cooking you know, barbecue. So I digress. So as you see, <laughs> we're going, we're, we're coming closer to how worship uh, uh, with blood uh, came about. 
because once we uh, ate the meat, our brains developed better. We could think better. We had consciousness. We started to say, who is God? What does God want? Why am I here? Of course, we, we would um, relate our human feelings and desires onto what our concept of God is. And in that, we said, oh, we like the meat. We like the blood. We like the burning smell of the meat and cooked meat. God likes the meat. And it was considered holy, the flesh, the blood. And then you can see that even in Leviticus. If, and now we're talking about the Bible. In Leviticus, it's uh, Leviticus 17, verse 11. I give you the blood because it's for purifying. So the blood is seen as something very sacred. Something even in, again, in, in, in the Bible, the life is in the blood. Now, with that understood, it's important. We're going to touch on um, the consumption of blood, okay? And the consumption of, so we have animal blood and human blood, okay? And we're talking about animal blood, animal sacrifice and human sacrifice, now, where do I go with the Bible here? Okay, so let me let me let me stay on track because I, I I can see I can see you and I can hear my my wheels going. Okay, if I'll go right to Jesus and and drink my blood and eat my flesh. But even though I said it, I'm not going to go to that. We're going to stay. We're going to go bit by bit. I'm going to start in Torah, but um, I just want to make it clear that in all sacrifice. All sacrifice, including the uh, Hebrew Bible, there is child sacrifice. There is human sacrifice. It's blatantly there. It's right in our faces. And then I will double down and say all sacrifice is consumed to an extent by those who are worthy, which is usually the priest or the congregation that those who are said to be holy. Okay. So, um, in, I mentioned Leviticus and there's a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different chapters, so to speak in the Bible that show you, okay, this is how you do this sacrifice. Like for instance, Leviticus seven, it, it talks about the Hata, the sin purification sacrifice. So we're going to focus on that. When I grab some scriptures, I'll, I'll go to Genesis chapter four, and we're going to take a look at something, what took place and relate that to blood sacrifice, the presence of animal sacrifice, as well as human sacrifice in the scriptures esoterically. So let me get that now. Um, okay, so let's see here. All right. Do you should I screen share or just read it in? Just read it. Okay. In chapter four of Genesis, what we have is Adam and Eve have been exiled and 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 sent out of the Garden of Eden. All right. In this chapter four, we see. The, the continuance of their existence, Adam and Eve. And it talks about how they can, they come together and they conceive, well, they make a child. She conceives um, Cain for, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, Cain first, that's her first child. And then she has another child named Abel. So she has two children in this story. I'll start at chapter four, verse three. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. So in those verses, you can see Blood sacrifice is the ultimate sacrifice that is respected. It's spoken of right here in this chapter. 
Abel's bringing vegetation, fruit of the ground, but it is rejected. It's not, it, his, his offering was not respected, but Abel's blood offering, that was respected. And he was the tender of, uh, Abel was the um, keeper of the flock, but Cain was the farmer. He was the one that tilled the ground, right? So uh, yes, there is more esoteric uh, arcane info in this chapter, but we're gonna focus on the topic, which is the blood sacrifice. So Cain is upset because he's not offering the blood and the fat, which as you see, it's being um, imparted onto God. Like uh, I'm going to, I like as a human, I like to taste the fat of the meat. I like the taste of the blood. I like the taste of the flesh. So God must like it. Okay. So that's what I'm saying about uh, how we develop this whole um, belief and this worship uh, that that in, that includes the slaughtering of animals and humans and the shedding of the blood and the consumption of the flesh and the blood. So it's clearly saying Cain's sacrifice is not accepted. So Genesis chapter four, verse seven says, God comes to Cain and talks to him about why he's upset. And here is the, here, we're going to break down this uh, particular verse. So here it says, if thou dost doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. If you read that in English, which I just did, it's very, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, you, what do you mean sin lies at the door? What do you mean if thou do well? I, I'm, I'm offering a sacrifice, right? But if you look at it in the Hebrew, which I will do right now, you will see what the true meaning is and what, what God, Yahweh, is telling Cain. And God is telling Cain, you need to bring a blood sacrifice and that is what is desired when you bleed bring a blood sacrifice you will be able to have power you know it says and you will rule over him or it will rule over him so let's break that down in the hebrew and i'll show you what i'm talking about okay so if we that's h518 that word if thou doest well as your top H3190, Yatab is. Strong's H3190, Yatab. 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 Okay. So that means to be glad, to be joyful, to be well placed, to be well for, to be well with, go well with, to be pleasing, to make glad, rejoice, to do good, to deal well. To make a thing good or right or beautiful, to do well or do right. So it also means to find favor, um, to, let's see, hold on, make well, to find favor. So basically to, to be pleasing. So basically your top means you'll be, you know, accepted or you'll, you'll be pleasing, do well, right? And then it, so it says, if thou doest well, your top Shalt, H3808, thou, H7613, shalt thou, so, so if you do well, shalt thou not be accepted? So God is telling King, listen, you know what, what to do. If you do the right thing, then you will be accepted like King, like Abel. Okay, and then it says, if you don't do the right thing, okay, if thou doest not well, so if you don't do Yatab, H3190, if you're not pleasing, that's what it says, if you're not pleasing, sin, H2403, that word hatat isn't just simply sin, it means a purification that comes along with sin. Usually when you see that word, 
and I'm going to say nine times out of ten, when you see that word in the Hebrew, it is indicating that there must that there is a purification, hata, a purification for sin that comes along with the actual sin and to not be pleasing, right? So when you read it in the way it says, if you do well, won't you be accepted? If you don't do well, sin, the purification, which is the blood sacrifice, I forgot to say that, all purification for sin is 100% blood sacrifice, okay? Some people say, well, what about when you don't have an animal, you can bring an ephah flower? That still doesn't take precedence and is not paramount over blood because Leviticus 17 11 says God says I gave you the blood to purify sins that's why I gave you blood so when you see this here and you read it it says sin meaning blood sacrifice a purification for the sin lieth place which that word lieth let me get it it's H7257 Ravas Strong's H7257. Ravats. Ravats. That means it has very many different meanings, but we're going to stay in the context of this. I'm going to read all the different meanings and then I'm going to explain what, what actually it means. Because remember, we're talking about the blood sacrifice. Now, in context, remember, Abel is accepted, Cain is not accepted in his sacrifice. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. God did not accept Cain's sacrifice. God is telling Cain, what's wrong with you? You'll be accepted if you bring a blood sacrifice, you see? So anyone saying, oh, no, that's not what it means. It's in the context. It's clear. God is instructing Cain, don't you know you need to bring a blood sac sacrifice? And that is hatat. That is the hatat. So ravas means to stretch oneself out, to lie down. That's not what's that that's not what that pertains to in the context of that particular verse to lie down to cause to lie down that's what it is to put to place something it's not about sin lying at the door that doesn't make sense but when you look at it in the context of what it should be you see placing the sacrifice and then here's another part of the of the definition to crouch on all fours on all, on all four legs folded like a recumbent animal. I'm going to say this again. To crouch on all four legs folded like a recumbent animal. Okay? To recline, to repose. So we know that it's not about anyone lying down and reclining. We know it's about an animal with all fours folded under a recumbent animal, animal right? And then if we go further, we look down more, it says... Um, there's another in, in, in the, the Jacenius Hebrew Chal, uh, Chaldee lexicon. It says here in that particular definition to lie down, to recline, as well remarked by uh, Simonis, used, here, here's the part you want to listen to, used of quadrupeds which lie on their breasts with their feet gathered under them. So it's clearly speaking about an animal. That makes more sense in this particular verse. The hatath, um, God says, right there, he says, you do well. He says, hatath, the sin offering, the purification, H2403, lie to place, it means to place, to put down an animal with the, um, you know, uh, the legs underneath it. So that's Ravas, h seven. 257 at the door pata that means just obviously pata uh bring it to off as an offering so at the door sin lies at the door is not what that means it says you you know it says you should bring a sin offering a blood offering if you want to be accepted now let me go a little further once the sin offering is brought to the door and unto thee, H413, let's see what happens. It says, shall be desire. It says his desire, right? H8669. Let's look at this. Okay. Strong's 
Strom's H8669, Teshuka. Teshuka. Okay. So it says, when you bring the blood sacrifice, the purification chataf, the purification for sin, and rabas, place it with legs underneath, so it's clearly as an animal, it says, uh, unto thee the desire, wait, wait, let me get that, I don't want to make a mistake, so give me one second, it says, and unto thee shall be, yes, the desire, so when you bring the blood sacrifice, you will be desired, it will be desired, actually, talking about the blood sacrifice. When you bring the blood sacrifice, the, the definition is desire, longing, craving. Desire, longing, craving. See, when people, especially Christians, when they, when they read that uh, verse in English, they don't get it. And they think, oh, it's because sin will rule over you. Why would sin rule over him for bringing vegetation? Why is that even being said to him that he needs to bring a different, you know, well, if you don't do well, why would God, if, if bringing vegetation is not evil, why would God stand over him saying, well, you know what's wrong. You, uh, you don't do well. Why is he seen to not do well? Because his sacrifice was not being accepted. It's because it wasn't a blood sacrifice. So it says that sin sacrifice, the chatat and, and the rabas placing it, then it says unto thee, Will the longing and craving be? Why will the longing and craving be? Because man craves blood, craves meat. So they put that um, characteristic under the God. God craves blood, craves meat. It says the desire, longing, craving of man for woman, of woman for, uh, for man, of beast to devour. There it is. That's what it is. That is what that word means in this verse. Of beast to devour. So it means when you bring that blood and that meat, there's going to be that longing to devour, that desire to devour, that craving to devour. To devour what? To devour the blood sacrifice that is, he's being told to bring. What happens when you bring that blood sacrifice that, uh, you know, when it says, then unto thee, meaning you, unto thee because you're bringing your sacrifice. You're bringing your sacrifice. So God wants to eat it up. I'm not being um, disrespectful. I'm, that's, that is pretty much what is being said in all of this blood sacrifice about God loves the smell of blood. He loves the animals. He needs the blood, sprinkle the blood. It's saying uh, there's a desire to devour it up. And what happens once you bring that blood and please and satiate God? What happens? Well, um, it says, and thou shalt rule over him. Rule over who? Rule over whoever receives the sacrifice, to be quite honest. Now, we could say rule over, rule over Abel as well. Because remember, Abel is getting all the praise, all the respect, and Cain isn't. So we could postulate um, in this particular verse that God is telling Cain, not only will, you be des will God desire your sacrifice, because we're not, it wouldn't mean that you're ruling over God, right? It mostly, it most probably means, from my interpretation and what I see from the breakdown, God saying, you'll have, you'll be over Abel. If you bring a blood sacrifice, you know, you're seeing Abel getting all, getting all the respect and all the glory. You'll be over Abel if you bring that blood sacrifice for the, you know, that's desired and craved. So what happens in Genesis chapter four, verse eight, Cain talked with, so he, he, God talked to him, God gave him the instructions and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother and slew him. So directly after the instruction, you need to bring a blood sacrifice, Cain. This is your problem. You're bringing vegetables. We need the fat of lambs like Abel. We need, we need blood and flesh. Cain directly after that goes to his brother. He didn't have a flock, by the way. Goes to his brother and he sheds his brother's blood. That's the first human sacrifice. And how do we know that? 
Well, remember, God instructed Cain, when you do bring this blood, you're going to roll over. You're going to be, you know, the envy that he had, the jealousy of Abel's, you know, blessings and Abel's um, uh, praise that he was getting and respect. Cain desired that. He envied that. You know, the, one, of the one of the commandments is, thou shalt not covet. But Cain exactly was coveting. So once he shed the, the blood of Abel, God comes along and we'll see what happens. What happens to him once he sheds the blood? So we'll get to that. One moment. So now we're going to look at... Was God telling the truth to Abel? If you do the blood sacrifice and you bring that blood, that flesh and blood that God desires, you will rule over him, meaning you'll be more powerful than Abel. Let's see. Let's see um, what happens. So he kills Abel. I mean, yes, he kills Abel. And then verse 9 says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Really quick sidebar, I haven't done this stream with you yet, but I hope I can. I, um, the, when you say the Lord, that is actually the leader of their tribe, which is considered their God, which is their, their mother Eve. Um, I'll, I'll get into that some other time, but I, I just really wanted to point that out because why would God not know where Abel is? You know, why would an al almighty omniscient God not know where somebody is because it's the it's the head of their their group their tribe and it's their mother so the Lord said unto Cain where is Abel thy brother and Cain said I know not am I my brother's keeper and he said of course the Bible says he um shout out to King James I'm just kidding. okay you can edit that out if you want. Uh, and he said, what hast thou done? But really it's his mom saying, and she, it's really, and she said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Okay. So right there, the Lord is saying, no, you killed your brother. I can feel the energy. I can feel the disconnect. I can feel that you've. You've slaughtered him, you know, and that you shed his blood as a sacrifice, as a human sacrifice. So, um, verse 11, the Lord continues on and says, and now thou art cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Now, this is similar to what happened to Adam and Eve in chapter 3. They were driven out. They were told, okay, you're cursed. The earth, you're you're going to have a tr have trouble with tilling the ground. These are the same, very similar curse that Adam received in the garden. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. That was a very big deal. Again, we're looking at the connection of how things used to, used to be. We were... Um, tribal being exiled from the tribe was, um, you know, pretty much uh, for sure death. You understand? So that is a serious curse, right? Um, it says, Thou tillest the ground, so you're, you're driven out as a fugitive and a bag, vagabond. So God is, you know, telling Cain which again, I believe that's his mother. If you even, if you believe the story, it's very emo emotional. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Now here comes the mercy. Now remember uh, in the Torah, uh, murder is 100%. You have to be put to death. We're not talking about the blood of Jesus just yet. This is talking about of course, this is Genesis. Yes, I know this isn't the law, but we're talking about those who wrote the law. Supposedly, you know, this is Moses, but whoever it is who wrote this knew the law, right? And they wrote this down knowing, okay, when you kill, 
you, when you murder, you take a life, then your life is taken. But let's see what happens in this story. And what, what, what I'm saying is, let's see what's being uh, taught, you know? Because remember, this is written down for all the people to read, right? So in this story, whatever happens in here, you, you know, you're telling the people, this is how God works. Take a look at it. So let's see what the people are being taught about God. All right. Behold, thou hast, so Cain is like, my punishment is too great. Verse 14, behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from thy face shall I be hidden. So he's like, I can't be around you anymore. So clearly there's a very strong, loving, uh, close relationship. Okay. People can say, okay, well, of course it's God, but how can you drive someone out from the face of God? If God is, um, uh, everywhere, you get what I'm saying? He's omnipresent. Again, that is why I keep pushing the whole, this is um, a, a head of the tribe who's telling, who's tell, making this judgment. So Cain says, um, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. So like I said, it's, it's a death sentence, usually to be driven out. But Cain appeals to God, which is the tribe leader, which is, from what I've seen, his mother, um, but the tribe leader. And so that person who sits back and thinks about it says unto him, verse 15, therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. So wait a minute. God, the Lord, isn't saying, hey, it's too bad. You know, you shouldn't have killed someone. An eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life. That was very malicious for you to kill your brother. It's out of my hands. No, what you see is God, the Lord, who instructed Abel, you need to do a blood sacrifice. I'm not saying, he, I mean, instructed Cain. I'm not saying that the Lord told Cain to go kill Abel, but I am saying 100% that the Lord God in this story said, you got to do a blood sacrifice. Okay. If you want to be uh, have power over Abel, if you want to get respect, if you want to get everything, you got to do some blood sacrifice. That's what was said in this chapter, in that verse that we talked about previously. So God says, okay, you know what? I'm going to protect you, Cain. So I'm going to say this to everyone. Whoever slays Cain puts a, lays a finger on him. I will take full vengeance on that particular person to the utmost complete punishment, which sevenfold is, that's what that sim symbolizes. It means completion, like the highest punishment. So God is saying, I'm going to protect you all the way completely. When you go out and then the Lord says, let me put a mark on you to make sure lest anybody find you, tries to kill you. So they know they better not touch you. They better not mess with you. Verse 16. So Cain went out. So he's protected by God. He's totally protected. He's feared amongst everyone. Okay. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So what happens to Cain after he sheds the blood? What happens when, when, the, when God, I'm going to keep repeating this, when the Lord told him, if you, if you do a blood sacrifice, you'll, you'll rule over him. You'll have power, right? So let's see what happens. Verse 17, Cain knew his wife, so he got a wife. She conceived and bare Enoch. He had a son. Cain built a city. So that sounds like a pretty blessed guy, right? He's, uh, he's got offspring, he's got a wife, built a city, called the name of the city after his son Enoch, which is, you know, he's a man of renown now. He's protected, you know, he's feared in the land. He's got, um, he's built a, a nice life. So going back to that verse, if you do the blood sacrifice, then, you know, you please the Lord, basically. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll have the desire 
and you'll be um, like an animal. Remember, like an animal craving something, and then you'll have power over Abel. You'll have that power. You'll be you'll be powerful. Looks like it came true according to this verse. Now, some might, you know, stay on that whole God said, you know, you're driven out. But no, at the end of that conversation, God was like, you're totally protected. Nobody better mess with you. And um, basically, you have carte blanche. Go out and do your thing. And that's exactly what he does. So he has the power. He gained the power from that blood sacrifice, from the human blood sacrifice. Now, yes, there's some other uh, points about blood sacrifice as far as energy, magnetizing energy for the spirit, which is actually in the blood, you know, in the blood cells, the red blood cells, there's iron and, you know, the heme. But um, we're talking about what is uh, the, the, um, the action of the blood sacrifice and what is the consequence and what comes from the blood sacrifice. And this is what God says throughout. This is what's said throughout Torah, not just in this verse, even in the law, in the Levitical law. Like I said, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. I gave you blood to purify, to sanctify things. It, you know, it makes things happen. You understand? So verse 19. Now this is a, oh, let me, verse 18. And unto Enoch was born Irad, and unto Irad beget Mahujael, and Mahujael beget Methusael, and Methusael beget Lamech. And Lamech took him unto him two wives. The names of the one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Those two names are esoteric, and they are, um, indicative of blood sacrifice um, being done by Lamech uh, in, the, in these upcoming verses. How do we know that? The word Adah means to prepare, to beautify in the Hebrew. Um, and Zillah means shadow. Okay. So we can look at several verses. Um, just Psalms 23, the shadow of death. God is a shadow. There are different, different, um, can you give me one second? I just have to, here it is. Okay, so here are the different verses that show in the sacrifice, we have um, the preparation of the sacrifice, the beautifying preparation to bring the sacrifice to God. And then we have two types of shadow. We have the shadow of God, which is the cloud even in the sanctuary, okay? And also the shadow of death, which is in several different verses in the Bible. So shade, cloud, shadow, that's a presence of God and the presence of um, the so-called uh, death. But we, you know, I want to make it clear that those who are um, doing the procession or doing the ritual, they do not call it death when they are doing the uh, sacrifice. They don't really see it as death, as unclean. They see it as purifying because it's, you know, the life being taken from the animal. I want to make that clear. However, in this, in the esoteric of Genesis chapter four, verse 19, those two names, Ada, beautify, which is also mean to prepare, to beautify, which is the, the sacrifice. You bring it, it's clean, unblemished. And then Zillah, we have shadow of God um, and the shadow of death. So in Psalms 23, that's a reference to the shadow of, of death. Um, Psalms 121, verse 5. Psalms 91, verse 1. Um, let's see here. Isaiah 49, verse 2. Isaiah 51, 16. Uh, so there are a lot of different... Job 12, 22... A lot of different uh, verses in the Bible showing God as darkness. Um, of course, we know the cloud in the sanctuary. I mentioned that. And we also know about the shadow of death. So why am I bringing that up? Because those two names are talking about a sacrifice being done um, by Lamech. Let's examine this closer so I can show you. So... Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zillah. And Adah bare Jabal, 
he was a father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. And his brother's name was Ju uh, and his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handled the harp and organ. So in Zilla, <clears throat> excuse me, Zilla, she bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artifice in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Now, verse 23. Now Lamech said unto his wives, now we're back about the wives. The wives are significant. That's why he's speaking to the wives, because esoterically it's showing this is about a sacrifice, the preparation and beautifying of the unblemished sacrifice and the shadow of God and death, the cloud, the shadow of the darkness of death, Zilla, Ada and Zilla. He said unto his wives, Adah and Zilla, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech. Now, in the English, it says, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. Let's look at it in the actual Hebrew and see what it really, really means esoterically, right? Okay, so, so Lamech, I want to get to the part where he says, unto his wives, okay? So by the way, a dot is H5711. Let me just, since I'm here, ornament, okay? It means ornament. It also means to beautify, uh, ornament, beauty. Um, let's see here. So yes, that's what that is speaking of, about the sacrifice being pure, unblemished, beautiful, okay? And also prepared um, for the slaughter, okay? So that one, and then we can go to Zilla. Let me keep going down, let me read. Um, so Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zilla, let's see what Zilla means. Zilla is H6741, and that means shade, okay? It also means shadow. It means shade, it means, yeah, I think that's about it all that's on here, is shade. Shade, okay, remember the cloud of God, the shadow of death, the darkness. Okay, so, so he said, hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain, that means to kill, to take the life of right? Harag. A man. Now, that doesn't mean man. That's actually, he's saying male. Let's hit H376. This is very interesting because what we're going to look at here is a child sacrifice. So, yes, Ish does mean man. It also means husband. But, let's... Psalms 376. Ish. Ish. Right. It means man a male, it also means male. So it, mean, it means if you're gonna distinguish between female, it means male. It means husband, servant, mankind, champion. We know that it's not talking about a champion or a servant. And we know it's not talking about a husband. Is it talking about a man? Well, let's see. Let's see if, it's, if that word just means male or if it means man. Okay, I have slain a man, it should say a male, to my wounding, to my wounding is is actually what he was saying is um, that has offended me, or let me let me read that word. It is pesa and it's H six four eight two. Let's see. Strong's H sixty four eighty two. Pesa, pesa. Okay, so to my wounding, it means bruise, wound. Okay. And, well, okay, I don't see it on here. I must have looked it up somewhere else. But nonetheless, it doesn't change the, um, the fact that it's a child sacrifice. So to, to my wounding, meaning uh, I, the, the person, the child has done something to him, right? Okay, so give me a minute. All right, here it is. H3206, he said, a man, that means a male. To my wounding, 
who has harmed me and a young man. So let's see if that means young man, age 3206. It actually means child, but let's see here. Strong's H3206. Yelid. Yelid. Yelad, Yelid. Now, in the definitions, Yelad means 100% it means child. It doesn't mean man. It doesn't mean young man. It means child in Hebrew. That is what that word means. The definitions here say child, son, boy, offspring, youth. And then it says child, son, boy. Then going further, it says child, children. Going a little further, it says descendants. And then the last two say youth and apostate. So as you see, it doesn't, he's not saying he's, 100% talking about a child, a male child. He says, I have, I have slain a male, not a man. H376 means male in this. Because it's not a man. How do we know? Because H3206 says Yalad. Yalad. Yalad means child. So he says, I have slain a male child to my hurt. Let's see what H2250 means. It's, oh, yes, that's what I want to point. It's H, that, that word to my hurt means uh, stripe, bruise, blow, a mark. So why would he say that he, he killed a child to his bruising? Yes, it says before I hurt a child that uh, wounded me, that bruised me. But then he says, I killed a, after he says, he says a young child who wounded me, I killed that child. I killed the child to a mark. I'm going to argue that that word stripe is a mark, a mark like who? A mark, the stripe, the mark, just like um, his, forefather Cain received okay so if you look at the again the Justinius Hebrew child lexicon it says a stripe or a bruise the mark of strokes on the skin it's right here it says a stripe or a, a bruise the mark of strokes on the skin. So he's saying to his to his wives with it, which is just uh, basically, you know, saying the sacrifice. There's those two names. He said, "I have killed. Uh, no, I have taken the life of, sacrificed a male child." Then he says, "To my mark." Why do I say that? Because when he, on the next verse, he says, he talks about Cain. Cain has also received a mark for doing what? The exact same thing, killing a human being. He was also marked. Cain was marked. Lamech says, I have killed a male child to, uh, and received to my mark. And then he says right here, that's why, you know, it's in the context. He says, if... Cain shall be avenged, mean, that really means protected, meaning if Cain shall be avenged, meaning if someone kills Cain and, and then God avenges, he says, if Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, so if God's going to kill somebody, you know, the uh, uh, ultimate uh, judgment, if God's going to do it sevenfold for Cain, truly Lamech, 70 and 70-fold. He's like, so I killed a little, I killed a, a male child and I have power. Who said that? God said it. God said, you have, if you do not, not the human sacrifice, I'm not saying God said that, but he, he's, he sees what happened. He sees my forefather killed his own brother. He made this empower, empire. He's, uh, you know, respected. Nobody can touch him. So look at me. I just killed a male child. So surely God is going to 
avenge my anybody who messes with me, it's going to be 70 and 70 fold. That is why previously I said he's talking about a mark when it says to my uh, when it says to my heart hurt. That is not what that means. It means he got a mark. So the translations are very it, it makes things very ambiguous and um, you really have to look past it. So I get it that, of course, this is my take on it. A lot of people don't believe this, but if you look at it this way, it makes much more sense um, how Cain could leave after he killed his brother. And God has not cursed Cain. In fact, the Israelites, that the ones who worship Yahweh, the Midianites and the Kenites, all, all those were within the um, land of Canaan. The Israelites, which I'm saying in the story Moses, he joined and followed that God. The God of, of Cain, of the Kenites, is the God of the metallurgy. That is Yahweh. Before it was Yahweh, actually, it, it was Hawa, which is Eve. Yeah. So that's, again, a different stream. But so that they're, they're powerful. Cain has not been cursed like uh, what, what as Christians were taught, oh, Cain, he's such a down guy. No, he, we're, the whole world that worships Yahweh is worshiping the God of Cain. That's the God of the Kenites, the God of metallurgy, the desert, the God of the, of the metal workers. Yahweh is their God. That's pretty powerful. Even further on in the scriptures, all throughout, you see God needs blood. He wants the blood. Go slay these people. Slay all of them. Bring the blood. Bring all the blood. I need this blood. Now we're going to go up to um, Abram. Abram, it said, you know, oh, he was set apart. You know, the, 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 the exoteric story that we're told that, uh, you know, God loved Abram and he was the one that you know, God called out, okay, that is what the story says. However, if you notice, I can get it in that story. God says, people think I'm going to start talking about Isaac. I'm not even going to talk about Isaac yet. Let's talk about his son that he longed for, Ishmael. And without a problem, his wife is having issues with the mother and he's like, okay, you got to go get out. I mean, that you have to look at the Bible and see what, um, how the death of children, how it was dealt with or how it was seen in stories. Just like today, we have abortion happening all the time. No one cares. I mean, I can't say no one cares because I care and there are people who are pro-choice. But my point is, it's considered civilized. It's considered, there are tons of debates, pro-choice, you know, and, and pro-life. So what's the difference? There was child sacrifice going on all through the Bible. Um, just like people consider abortion today, they say, oh, it's not a life. Well, how do you think the people back then were doing probably, look at look at the way survival was. Oh, well, it's just a little baby. It hasn't even lived. It can't talk. It's, it, it's right, that is the mindset. So um, where Abram lived, Abraham, um, there were Tophets, which were places where child sacrifice took place. Um, now people say, well, that was to the God of God, Moloch. And the most high says, don't do child sacrifice. No, the most high says, don't sacrifice children to Moloch. The most high says, do not pass your child through the fire for Moloch. The most high doesn't forbid child sacrifice at all. Going back to the story of Abram, um, people were sacrificing their children all the time in the, in that region, in the land of Canaan. It was a known thing to do. And Abram, if I can just get that, I'll go ahead and read it. Oh, I talked about how he sent. Okay, so we know Ishmael. It was no problem for him to send him out. And then God asks Isaac 
to, no, asks Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac. Now, we need to examine that. I just want to get the verse. Here it is. Genesis verse 22. Okay, verse 2. And he said, take now thy son. This is God talking to Abraham. Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt up. Excuse me for a burnt offering up on one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now let's examine that for a minute. Because you know what people say, well, God was just testing him. The scriptures say God doesn't tempt man. That's exactly what the scriptures say. It says God does not tempt man. I got to get it. Let's get, let's get through scriptures because, uh, Let's get that. I should have had it ready, but I didn't think about using it. James chapter one, verse three. God tempts no one. Okay. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So we just saw the scriptures. God doesn't tempt anyone with evil. God would not tell Abram, I want you to go and um, make love to your neighbor's wife. Oh, you didn't, you, you were going to do it. Stop. I just wanted to see. Why would God tell him to do something? This is my point. Please, everyone listen. Why would God tell him to do something evil? It wasn't considered evil. This is the proof. God wasn't telling him to go have, have commit adultery. God wasn't telling him to go kill his neighbor. God wasn't telling him, go steal your neighbor's sheep. Those are all against commandments, right? God said, go sacrifice your child. Then he, he, it was no brainer. He didn't say, God, what? Because what? it was common to sacrifice your children to God. When he got up there and God said, oh, stop. Exoterically, you see God saying, oh, just wanted to see if you love me. But if you sit back and look at the deeper meaning of that, God was saying, you were going to do something awesome. That's what that means. God is saying, you were going to sacrifice. That's the ultimate thing. Why do we know that? Because doesn't God sacrifice his only son? And it's considered the ultimate thing. Proof that child sacrifice is 100% in the Bible. And, and, it's, and it's considered godly. Now, in Numbers, we talked about the virgins. 32 virgins were offered up to God. They weren't offered to the priest. When, when Moses commanded the men of Israel to go slay the Midianites in numbers. He said, okay, we're going to divvy up these animals and the, the young children, the virgins, they were children, by the way, and some of them are going to go to God. How many? 32. 32 of those virgin children were offered to God. Okay. Now, in Leviticus 26, verse 29, I'll get that. Just touching on, there's so much, liter there's so many verses where God says, you know, go slaughter, go kill. But let's look at Leviticus 26, verse 29 and read that. And there's so many different verses showing God saying, eat your children, sacrifice your children. Okay. He says, I want your firstborn. Verse 26, verse 29 in Leviticus, and ye shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters shall ye eat. And I will destroy your high places and cut down your images and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols 
and my soul shall abhor you. Now people say, see, God was killing that. That was because they were doing the wrong thing. It doesn't matter. God doesn't do evil and God doesn't command us to do evil. When have you ever seen God command us to do evil? The scripture says God doesn't tempt man. So if God says we're going to eat our children, it is ordained and divinely uh, commanded by God. Think about that. It's commanded by God that we will eat our children, even if it is a punishment. That's the way God's punishing us. He didn't say, I'm going to punish you by uh, you committing adultery, or I'm going to punish you by um, you eating pork chops. And I'm being serious. I know it sounds facetious, but God doesn't command sin. God doesn't command sin. Now, God didn't say in that verse, you're eating your children, so I'm going to punish you. Don't you get it? See, this is the problem with the indoctrinated um, uh, cognitive dissonance that goes on. You want to say, oh, no, God would never want. It's all through the Bible that we do, that God commands blood sacrifice. God wants to eat you to eat the flesh of children and drink the blood. Now, is that really God? No. That's my point. Now, I say no, but for those who find that to be divinely inspired and um, say God, everything is God in the Bible, then you have to admit that God's saying, eat your children. But that's where I said, when we started to eat flesh and it started to give us, you know, we, we sometimes drinking blood, there's, there's um, information out there that it, it, it makes people ecstatic. Uh, there's adrenochrome in the slaughtering. And that's another thing I want to point out. Because I had discussed this before about blood and sacrifice. There are only two um, functions of, uh, uh, or should I say, two ways of blood coming out where there is no uh, fear, no terror, no, no death. And that's menstrual moon cycle and placenta, uh, birth blood. Ironically, those are condemned in the Bible. It said, don't touch the woman after she has the child. It says, don't touch the woman. But those are the blood, that's the blood that doesn't require death or terror. Now, when you think about that, you say, interesting, because what is it about the animal with the knife to the throat or the human with the knife to the throat? The terror. There's an energy that's pulled to it that's electromagnetism that's actually in the blood, but also metaphysically there's uh, an energy and then there's an ecstasy also. Now people might say, well, ecstasy, that's, you know, that's, um, that's about pleasure. There's also a threshold. And there is, if you imagine a line like between uh, pleasure is at the top and pain is at the bottom and there's a line that demarcates it, right? When you get so high up in the pain you enter into ec ecstasy. It's in a lot of stuff. Uh, we've got the um, Opus Dei, I believe, the, that, that particular cult. We've got different cults of the, the, those who worship Dionysus um, when they actually devoured the God. De uh, actually, they, excuse me, they devoured the God, and, and, but that's a different, I'm going to get on that. But the followers of Dionysus, which is also Bacchus, they would tear the sacrifice up in a frenzy with their bare hands and teeth and eat the blood and to where they were just lost. And it was just so much of a frenzy and so much ecstasy. There's something in that, not just for the sacrifice, but also for those who are consuming the blood. The blood, the adrenochrome is very, very real. There is, uh, there, there are people who farm adrenochrome. There are people who um, do bloodletting and they sell the, the blood for, from people being terrified and then the adrenochrome's in the blood and they drink it. So we know all about this. It's, it, we're exposed to this. It's, in the, it's, it's readily out there, the information. So I'm getting back to the difference between birth blood and moon blood cycle, the moon cycle blood. There's no adrenochrome, there's no terror. There's no death, so that's different blood. The sacrifice 
always must have some type of that X, I'm going to say it, that, ec that ecstatic element, element, excuse me, that ecstatic element of crossing the threshold of pain, terror, and moving through, and there's a peacefulness. And I want to also say, even in NDEs, when you hear people say, I was so scared, I was dying, but then there was this great peace over me. When they reached a point, they said, there's, so, so anyway, there's something about that that's, um, that's related to the actual ritual killing of the animal. Going back to um, the child sacrifice, okay? Talking about children, um, it, that it's, it was common, that it's all through the Bible, um, we talk about the, the God of the Bible saying, I want your firstborn son. I want your firstborn child. That was considered the, the, the most, um, you know, that's the child that's, that, that takes on the legacy, that takes on the inheritance. So basically, basically, we, so I've already gone over established that the blood sacrifice uh, of children and humans is 100% in the Bible. Uh, I want to make sure that I reiterate that the blood is what God says is required. Now, I even can show that when God says don't consume the blood, well, when it's said that God says don't consume blood, it's speaking about for the common person, okay? The common man, because it's not considered common. It is something sacred for the holy. You don't uh, mix the profane, which is com mean, just means common, with the, um, with the holy at the scripture. Okay, so remember I said Leviticus 17.11, or the life of the flesh is in the, well, let me go to this, to chapter, to verse 10. Oh, here's something else I wanted to point out. When I said at the door, verse nine in Leviticus 17, it shows right here. Bring it, the, bring it, it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Talking about the, the sacrifice. The sacrifice was brought to the door. That's also, remember, in, in chapter 4 when it says sin at the door. It doesn't mean sin at the door. It means sacrifice at the door. So Leviticus 17, verse 10 says, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that so sojourn among you that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood. I will cut him off from amongst his people. Verse 11. Well, why will God do that? Verse 11 explains. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you up on the altar to make an atonement for your souls. You see, that's the key. When God says don't, when God says don't take the blood, no one should be drinking the blood in their homes, in their dwelling. And there is a verse where it says, in your dwelling place. It says, because, verse 11 says, because that blood is for the altar. It's for the holy. It's for the, the procession um, of the sacrifice done by the priest and, and to whoever is worthy to receive it. That's why Jesus says, drink this cup of blood. Do not drink it if you're not worthy. I got to get that for you. I got to get that for you. Okay. Um, Jesus says, drink the blood. Why would Jesus say, drink my blood, even if it is symbolic? Jesus wouldn't say, uh, go murder your brothers and sisters, symbolically. Jesus wouldn't say, go steal from your neighbor, symbolically. Jesus would not say, go commit adultery, symbolically. My point is, Jesus wouldn't symbolically say to do something evil. It is something that is sacred and it is something that is that is regularly done by the priest and whoever is worthy in the procession of the ritual and the sacrifice, okay?
So just one moment. All right, so it, it's not actually Jesus, but it is in Corinthians. First Corinthians eleven twenty seven says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. So right there, that's what I want to point out. Like in Leviticus, there were certain people who could drink the cup of, uh, of the blood, drink the, the drink offering. There were those who could eat the off the uh, sacrifice because they were considered holy. So my I'm pointing out that when the law is saying do not drink the blood or eat the blood, it's saying you cannot do this because it is something set apart and specific for the altar. Our altar, I'll read it again. Leviticus 17, 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the souls. That, therefore, you can't just drink blood and just be doing it commonly. It's something very sacred, blood. That doesn't mean that the priests were not consuming it. An example of the priests having different rules than the common man is the daily sacrifice, which was burnt on Sabbath. Okay, you're not supposed to kindle a fire on Sabbath, but the priest did kindle a fire in the morning and the, and the night for the Sabbath uh, sacrifice. So they have different rules. The common man in his dwelling could not kindle a fire. fire. Exodus 35.3. You shall kindle no fire throughout. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Okay? So the common people could not start a fire on Sabbath in their homes. But the priests could start a fire in the same it, for the sacrifice, the daily sacrifice. There is it that's proof that there's a difference between what the priest can do and what people can do under the uh, government and the um, under the supervision of the priest. There's a difference between that and what the common person can do in their dwelling. I'll read it again. You shall kindle no fire throughout your dwellings on the Sabbath day. Okay. Let's see here. Uh, I think it's yes, Exodus 29, verse 38. And it also says, see Leviticus chapter 1. This, well, this twice daily offering was known as the continual burnt offering. It was offered at the door, there it is, of the tabernacle. The word continual means continually. The Hebrew word for burnt, burnt offering is olah, meaning ascent stairway or steps okay so there it is there's a proof let's see leviticus chapter one the lord called to moses and spoke to him from the tabernacle of the meeting saying speak to the children of israel and say to them when any one of you bring an offering to the lord you shall bring your offering oh, okay that wasn't it well anyway it was twice daily exodus 29 Okay, now this is what you, Exodus 29, verse 38. Now this is what you shall offer on the altar. Two lambs of the first year, meaning a young child, you know, a, a, a young lamb, you understand? Uh, day by day, continually, that means Sabbath. So there's proof that the priest could start a fire. You just, the common man could not start a fire. It says, Offer in the morning and offer at twilight. So that was every day. Why am I saying this? Because we need to point out that these priests were in fact doing the, the blood sacrifice and consuming the blood. Okay, because it was, it, it was set apart. It was a holy ritual. How do I know this? Because um, it's, it's logical that it's impossible for you to eat meat and not eat the blood. So God's not telling us not to eat the blood of animals. It's 
if that was the case, he'd say, don't eat animals because even if you cook it, it's still blood. So when you read that verse in Genesis, I believe it's chapter nine uh, with Noah, it's talking about the common man just killing somebody and eating their flesh. No way. That is not the way you're supposed to do it. Let's look at that. Genesis 9, chapter 3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Right there, God's saying, there's no prohibition on any type of flesh. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. So at this point, in this particular chapter, it's being said, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Then it goes on to say, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, you shall not eat. Meaning you can't just go kill and just start consuming blood. That is for the altar, Leviticus 17, verse 11. That is for the altar. And then, of course, that's also what, that would be murder if you kill a man. So let's go to chapter, verse 5. Surely your, blood, surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. So if you shed man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in an image of God made he man. Again, this is for the common man. This isn't about what the priest is doing to offer to God. Why? Why is this being said? Because God says in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, that blood is for the altar. That is what it says. So I need to make clear there's nothing in the Bible saying that the priest or that God and in these, these rituals and in these sacrifices, in these processions uh, in the tabernacle and uh, all done by the Levit Levitical uh, law, there's nothing saying that you can't consume the blood or, or even that it can't be human, to be honest. So... so. Oh, I want to show you just to, to just make sure that I show, you know, my P, dot my I's and cross my T's. Okay, so in Leviticus 7, get to that where. Here it is. Leviticus 7, verse 26 says, Moreover, ye shall not eat no, wait, I'm sorry. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be a fowl or beast, in any of your dwellings. Let me say that again. See, this is talking to the common man. Remember it said, on Sabbath, no one can kindle a fire in their dwellings. But then the priests kindle the fire all on Sabbath. I'm saying, excuse me. It says don't kindle a fire on Sabbath. You can kindle a fire in your dwellings. I should have specified that. On Sabbath, it says do not kindle a fire in your dwellings. It's against the Lord. But the priests could kindle a fire on Shabbat in the morning and in twilight for the daily burnt offering. The, the priest has different rules. The priest is set apart. The blood is for the altar. The blood is for the sacrifice. The priest has the right to the blood. The priest does the drinking of the blood, the eating of the flesh, the killing of the animal. The priest is set apart. Moreover, ye shall eat no manner of blood, whether it be a fowl or beast in any of your dwellings. Verse 26 in chapter 7 of Leviticus. Whatsoever, whatsoever soul it be that eateth any manner of blood, even that soul shall be cut off from his people. In the context of what it's telling them, 
don't you think you as a common man can get this sacred purifying substance, which is blood, and just drink it? Leviticus 17, verse 11, it is a purifying holy substance for the altar, for God to purify of your sins. It's set apart. You guys can't just be walking around drinking blood and doing, no, this is for God. We drink the blood and eat the flesh in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle. It's not something common, but was it done? 100% it was done. How do I know? Because there's a drink offering, number one. It's usually, and by the way, it's always, uh, in modern times, it's always symbolized by red wine. And number two, Jesus, in this whole fight, whether you believe in the New Testament or not, Jesus is considered a Israelite who knows the law and is a priest, you know, the priest. And he says, drink my blood and eat my flesh. He knew all about the procession. So going, I, I want to talk about just quickly um, the history of the gods. I talked about in the beginning how we can link blood sacrifice to the eating of flesh and the desire for, for meat and blood because it, it, first off, it made us much more intelligent when we started to become meat-eating animals, uh, species, hominids. So as homo sapiens, we began to uh, conceptualize God and know what, and we had consciousness. You know, we looking at the cosmos, everything started to, uh, we were a reflection of our God. With that said, we know that the Hebrew Israelite faith is a younger faith compared to the faiths of, um, you know, African spiritualities, uh, Asian spiritualities, and it's there's something very common in all of these different stories of these gods. Not all, but most. I mean, I, I'm sure I could uh, tie it all together if I look at each one. But if we look at um, the god uh, Dionysus, I'm going to the Greek first, Bacchus. The story is that he is the, the god was eaten by the people. The god was eaten. You look at the story of Jesus. Jesus says, eat me, eat my flesh. You look at the story of... Um, now, by the way, sex and eating are, are very interchangeable in these stories. Look at the story of, um, of, our Osi of Osar, Osiris. He's consumed after he's cut up, ripped to pieces by Seth. He's consumed and by, by his wife and then reincarnated from, she takes him in. That's my point. The consumption isn't just to uh, imbibe or to eat you take in. So there's a taking in of the God and then the God is resurrected in all of these stories. I mean, pretty much all of them. We could examine each one, one by one, but the major stories like, uh, like I said, Osiris, Tammuz and Nimrod. Nimrod, again, he's torn to pieces, he's put back together and consumed, taken in by, by Semiramis and then he's resurrected as Tammuz. So Dionysus, uh, Dionysus, whatever you say, Dionysus, Dionysus, um, Jesus, Asar, Nimrod. Uh, there's many other gods that are eaten. Even the story of Tiamat, she's consumed or uh, used up by the earth itself. Like all of her, I believe her blood is used to make the earth. So the God dies and the flesh and the blood or the essence of the God is consumed by those who worship and, and adore the God. You know, now, of course, you can say, well, Dionysus wasn't completely adored by the Titans, but he was actually worshiped by the Titans because Zeus, he was the son of Zeus. 
and the Titans were underneath him. So technically they were worshiping. worshiping. My point is, in our belief as humans, to the, the ultimate worship is to eat the God or to, to reproduce if you're looking at the sexual side, because there's eating and there's, there's sexual reproduction. That's the basis of all worship. I'm gonna say that, I'm gonna keep repeating that because eating and reproduction are the basis of all worship. So when you look at, um, when you look at uh, these stories, to be closest to the God is to consume the God, to take the God in, in a physical way. Of course, spiritually, metaphysically, we know I want God, to, God is in me. I want to be filled with the love of God, the light of God. You know, I want to have the power, but we're looking at different perspectives, di different aspects. And on a physical, from a physical aspect, eating and, um, you know, uh, reproducing with, you know, the sexual side of it. That's very interesting because as, uh, and one more thing I want to add is we are set apart. People say, well, what, what sets us apart? We're bipedal. Yes, that sets us apart, I guess, but orangutans, they can walk sometimes. They're bipedal, not, not continuously. And then we have, um, sometimes you might see uh, any other primate stand in their bipedal. They don't stay bipedal, but my point is what really sets us apart is that we worship. And how do we worship? It's cooking and, and eating and reproducing. You know, that is how we do, that is how we base our worship. If you really look at it, everything that we do, every religion is about, um, it's got some type of love basis, like, you know, Asar and Isis, you know, you've got uh, Jesus, I'm sorry, Mary and Joseph, you've got um, uh, Nimrod and Semiramis, all of these different stories, they've got this, big, uh, you know, what, what sets us apart is that we cook, we're the ones that prepare food, we use food as, as something divine, we use food as something spiritual, I don't know. I mean, of course, I could be ignorant and, and I just don't know animals like that. But I think we're set apart in that way that we use our food and our cooking and our preparation of food and our love making to link us to God. So it makes it very it's very primitive when you look at it. Um, it, it it's for me, I am a theist. I do believe in a higher power. So I'll say that is a a way that we could we use to conceptualize or to connect to God, but for those who don't believe, an atheist can say, okay, that's what they how they that's how they made God up through just that basic um, need to eat. By the way, what's the what's similar? Or what what do uh, what does eating and and making love have in common? It's survival. It's survival. So eating. Is survival and making reproducing is survival, and that is the basis of all of our of our spirituality. And that goes that's the blood sacrifice. When we started, I'll say it in closing, when we started to eat meat, our brains grew uh, almost double the size. We used more our our intestinal tract shrunk. We used more energy to building our brains and less because we didn't have to use so much energy for digestion. And then that's when blood consumption came in and the way blood, the chemical reaction that we have to, to eating blood, um, you know, the, when I said the um, uh, omophagy, the raw meat. So, and then, yeah, 